I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about genetics. You may have had genetic testing from your conventional doctor, and this testing that we're doing is very different. This really gives us targeted diet and lifestyle changes for both men and women, so then we can optimize your chances of pregnancy success. So looking at methylation, looking at your, your, your vitamins, looking at your predisposition to um, if there's miscarriage or looking at... Um, thyroid issues, blood sugar issues, all of this can really help then optimize your body for a baby. So I'm really excited to include genetic testing as part of our fat fertile method and excited for you to understand exactly why it's so important and really how it can help you on your journey to pregnancy success. Thanks a lot for listening. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I am welcoming Dr. Piper Gibson to the podcast, and we're digging into genetic testing and how this can help you on your journey to pregnancy success. Dr. Piper Gibson is a doctor of advanced holistic nutrition, board certified doctor of natural medicine, specializing in children's neurodevelopmental disorders, Additionally, she serves as a director of advanced holistic nutrition and nutrigenomics. Thanks so much for listening. And I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Dr. Piper, excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I'm super excited, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. If you could share with us really how you came to do this work and how you have your own journey. I do have my own journey. So 10 years ago, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Um, my oldest son was diagnosed with a transient neurological tick. So one day he was fine. And the next day he was having these really aggressive tick symptoms, twitching his neck and clearing his throat and repetitively saying things over and over again. And so as parents, we were, we were terrified. We doctor Googled, we tried 10 different doctors, eight different prescriptions. Well, we found this amazing doctor who offered us some genetic testing. And at that point we were like, yes, give it to us. We will try it. And we did the testing and we created a genetic protocol for my son. So based on his genes and within 30 days, we saw huge changes, behavior, tick symptoms, sensory issues, all sorts of things improved really quickly for us. And at that point I said, teach me how to do this. I need to know how to do this. Um, Dr. Kendall Stewart, uh, is the creator of GX sciences. And so I started doing his training and really learning everything he had to offer. And so they called me up at one point and said, we are looking for a nutrigenomic specialist. And I said, I'm your girl. So that's really how I ended up here. I'm truly, truly passionate about nutrigenomics and a genetic roadmap. Mm, I love it. I love it. And so, um, yeah, so if you could share with us, okay. So basically, um, so let, let's talk about the emerging field of nutrigenomics, like what exactly is that? And why would it matter for someone who's on the fertility journey to even look at this? So nutrigenomics really looks at the impact of diet, nutrition, environment on your genes and your genes impact on them as well. So how well it's functioning, we hear all the time, genetics load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. And when we can do nutrigenomic testing, we can really look at what your body needs, what can we remove and what can we reinforce in order to give you optimal health. When it comes to the fer fertility journey, the hormone journey, we can really look at specific genetic variants to determine your specific needs. What do you need to help you, you know, get pregnant, stay pregnant? All of these things, we can use this nutrigenomic testing to figure out you know, the right nutrition, the right supplements and the right dose at the right time for the right person. Yeah. I love it. That truly personalized approach, which really the, with the functional side of things. So we're doing food sensitivity testing and gut testing and really bringing in this genetic testing to really further personalize this for people. And so, it, and a lot of it, you know, we'll talk about this later helps with adherence where you're like, wait a minute, you know, I know this is, this is how I'm, how my genes are now. I know what I need to do. So um, let's talk about the genetic testing that a couple may receive from their fertility uh, specialist, their endocrinologist, uh, some genetic testing there and how really the female and male panel uh, testing that we're doing is, is different from that. So most of the time when you are getting, you know, testing from your endocrinologist or other areas, they are really looking at 
chromosome mutations. So they're looking at, you know, you carry hundreds of thousands of genes on each chromosome, and we're really looking at, you know, the cell division, what happens at fertilization, have there been deleted genes or changes in the number of genes? So they're really looking more at this, this bigger picture of a chromosome. We are looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms. You have four base pairs that basically act like your computer code. And when we have a change in those base pairs, that information that our genes are sending and telling our body what to do may not work as well, or it may work at a faster rate. And so when we can look at those single nucleotide polymorphisms, we can look at what those actions are going to be within the body. And so just like your computer code, if your computer code gets changed, your computer doesn't work as well. It's really the same thing with, with those single nucleotide polymorphisms. If your code, your base pairs get changed, those signals are going to be a little bit different. Yeah. So the gen genetics testing you're getting with your conventional doctor, that is like baseline things for you to, to look at if there's any kind of history for, um, you know, history that you need to be aware of. This is more, how do you personalize your diet and lifestyle based on right. And and those things they're looking at on the chromosome level are more like things like fragile X or down syndrome, where we're looking at, you know, just your code got changed. How can we refine your diet and lifestyle to give you that optimal support so that your body is the perfect place to grow a little baby? Yeah. Awesome. So if you're following along here, we're going to be uh, sharing a, um, a female and a male pa uh, panel with, with you. So um, you can jump on over to YouTube and uh, check it out there, but we're going to take you through one now. So you can kind of have, um, have a, a peek at that. So uh, uh, Dr. Piper is going to share her screen um, and we'll just kind of look at these, these markers and really kind of run down of what we're, you know, looking at in this test and why it's going to be important for you. And, you know, we're specializing in low AMH and high FSH, diminished ovarian reserve and premature ovarian insufficiency. So typically those diagnoses, you know, can be, people have been told that, you know, donor eggs are their only option. We're helping people get pregnant naturally or improve their chances of pregnancy success with their own eggs. So this, this test is really can be a, you know, a vital part of what's been missed. Can you see my screen? Okay, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So when we are looking at the men's and women's health panel, they are different. And we are really looking at specific things. So this first section, we're looking at testosterone metabolism. We need to know, you know, for sperm count, it's important. How well do you metabolize testosterone? And when we're looking at this pathway, we can really see, is this particular male? I mean, this is an older male. He's 56, but you know, is this particular male having a hard time metabolizing that estrogen? We know that in this pathway, you know, a COMT is essential for ridding the body of harmful estrogen metabolites. And really estrogen dominance in a male can lead to a lower sperm count. So we can tell, you know, are you really predisposed to more of an estrogen dominance issue, a harder time metabolizing testosterone? And what do we need to do to support that? So each panel actually comes with recommended therapeutics, uh, provider discretion therapeutics. So this is where we want to know our patients and our clients and what they're dealing with and what their real symptoms are. We can look at lifestyle recommendations. There's additional laboratory recommendations. So we can really look at these genetic variants and figure out, well, you, you may have a harder time breaking down this estrogen. Do you have estrogen dominance as a male? And you can look at other things like a Dutch test to clinically correlate that information, but we can really look at that here. Um, we know that healthy levels of testosterone in the body, uh, actually here with this COMT, um, you can tend to have what's called a faster COMT. So meaning you actually have uh, higher levels of testosterone, and then you actually have lower levels of dopamine. So it really makes men a little bit more dopamine seeking. Um, this COMT here is just going to be a little bit slower. You may have um, some different levels of testosterone. So at this point, you could look at that testosterone and see where you're at. What, what are your levels? Um, but, yeah, you know, we really, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And so even though we're dealing with, you know, um, a female factor, that's, you know, 50% of the people that are coming to us with 50% of now with male and female fertility. So we're seeing male factor issues with low motility, low sperm count, DNA fragmentation. So something like an estrogen dominance or, um, 
uh, like the t- testosterone, what are some, some, um, signs that they, they, they'd be showing there as far as, um, like for some, some symptoms they would have. Mm-hmm. Some of the, go ahead. Yeah. Some of the biggest signs of estrogen dominance in men and women is really having carrying more of this weight around kind of the middle and the hips. So kind of having more of that spare tire issue down here, um, things like brain fog, exhaustion, low libido, definitely all kind of symptoms, you know, men experience when they might be having this, this estrogen dominance issue. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, and so, and next on our, on the panel here, we have, we have metabolic risk factors. So there's a couple of important things when we're looking at metabolic risk factor, two of those have to do with thyroid support. So Foxy one and DIO two really have to do with thyroid support. Do you have an increased need of iodine? Do you have this increased need of selenium, which is going to support that conversion of T3, T4? So when we are looking at that, we know that primary hypothyroidism can actually lead to reduced free testosterone. So what we want to do is look at, you know, do you have these thyroid issues? Should we be running a routine thyroid panel with you to really look at how we can support your thyroid? And in return, that may actually support your testosterone levels. Yeah, for sure. That's something we see all the time with both men and women where they've been typically either they're told the TSH is normal. No one's looked up at a full panel or uh, they are on medication and they're, then they're not doing the under that, you know, the, you can be on medication, but you still also have to look at the diet and lifestyle changes to help, to help optimize. Cause really why is the thyroid off to begin with? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the next little part on here, this is autophagy. So these ATG genes, This is your body's cellular recycling system. This is where we are looking at your body's ability to do what it needs to do in the cell and then get rid of the waste and reuse what needs to be reused. So what happens here is these genes form what's called an autophagosome. So I explain it, think of it like a garbage bag. It's going to come into the cell. It's going to form this garbage bag. And then we have what's called a lysosome. It comes in, it binds, it's got some enzymes that are going to break down that waste and then help you get rid of it. What happens when we have variants in these genes is we don't make this garbage bag very well. And when we don't make that garbage bag, we can't do the breakdown because we don't have that good binding going on. So I explain it like, think of it like a water balloon. You have a full water balloon. Nothing else is getting in. It's very much the same when we have cells that are full of cellular waste, nothing else is getting in. We know with these particular genes that we have an increased risk of type two diabetes and insulin resistance because we can't get glucose into the cell to make energy and you need glucose in the cell to make energy. So that's really important when we're looking at fertility, because if your body's not making enough energy in the first place, you know, those sex hormones are going to kind of be the first thing to go your body's going to want to do everything it can to stay alive and to make energy. And those, those sex hormones are going to be pushed out the door. So one of the things that we can use is something called D chiro inositol. It's vitamin B8, but it's the body's second, second insulin signaler. So it's going to help to get that glucose into the cell so you can make energy. But then we can also look at, you know, if you have these risks of type two diabetes, um, we want to know we can test glucose, insulin, HbA1c, we can do 12 to 15 hour fasting. We can make sure that these people are exercising because it does improve autophagy so that they have a better chance of, you know, having uh, good energy production and, and a better chance at fertility. Yeah. And that's something we see again, a theme with, with men and women with insulin resistance, and then there could be sleep issues with sleep. When, if you have issues with sleep that impacts the insulin. So it's a whole you know, chicken or the egg thing, but definitely, yeah, good to see on here that, you know, you can see it in black and white. And if you've got a predisposition to it, there's things you can do to prevent it. Exactly. And then the last couple genes on the men's panel are ACE and AGT. These are your hypertension risk. And, you know, we do see men who have that higher hypertension. They have some, some harder, harder times with, uh, circulation in general. And so we know that, you know, men over 40 may need to restrict their salt. They have that increased risk of hypertension. So checking their blood pressure, um, just looking at their stress levels, men 
you know, especially those that might be super dopamine seeking might have, you know, really higher stress levels, especially based on some of their jobs and the work that they're doing. And it's really important to look at that, um, you know, because men here often experience erectile dysfunction when they're under this high levels of stress with hypertension. And of course, you know, that's really going to affect, affect the fertility issues as well. Can you talk about the dopamine uh, seeking piece of this, where is that people are kind of like doing that, like, oh, they've got to jump out the plane to get the, to get the, the, the high as, and yeah. And then sort of and sometimes interesting too, where people are coming in, coming in the house or like, give me a glass of wine because they can't relax and with their neurotransmitters and things like that. Can you just talk about the dopamine side of things? Yeah. So that really has a lot to do with there's several other neurotransmitters that can be looked at, but you know, on this one specifically, it's looking at that COMT. And we know that men who have actually higher levels of this testosterone, their COMT works faster. They may have lower levels of dopamine. So at that point, they may be more, more dopamine seeking, doing those things like jumping out of the plane, or, you know, they, they have this inability to really calm themselves down. When we see this though, you know, it's really that slower issue. And we see men here may have higher levels of dopamine. They may have more anxiety, more depression. Um, so I do see where, you know, having that glass of wine or whatever they need to calm down can be beneficial, but there's things that you can do. You know, if you have that estrogen dominance, you can work through the estrogen dominance. Um, there's something called methyl donors. So trimethylglycine, dimethylglycine, vitamin B2, really effective in helping to clear out the dopamine that's kind of stuck in the synaptic cleft. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anything else on the male panel for us to look at? I think that's it. I'll just kind of give you a brief overview that, you know, the panels really kind of include some additional information, you know, charts, graphs, the women's panel is a little more extensive. So Mm -hmm. if you want to hop over there, we can. Sure. Let's do it. All right. This is the women's panel. Okay, great. And this is just the example report. We are looking at, you know, a 40 year old female, but when we're looking at this, what we, this is actually a little bit more extensive than the men's panel. But when we're looking at this first section, we're looking at vitamin conversion and delivery. We know that folate is so important for the process of getting pregnant, staying pregnant, having a healthy baby, that it's very important. And we're talking folate. We're not talking folic acid. Folic acid is the synthetic form. Folate is, you know, the natural form that we are looking at here. But what we are looking at is your body's ability in this chain. Some of you may have heard of MTHFR and you may have had, you know, um, your OBGYN test you for just one gene. You're looking at MTHFR. We actually look at the whole chain because you can have methylation issues and not have an MTHFR variant. So what we are looking at here is we're looking at your folate receptors, folate receptor one and two. What is your ability to actually get folic acid into the cell so that you can start this process. What we're really doing here is taking a water soluble vitamin and turning it into a fat soluble vitamin so that it can get into the cells. Um, so the right off the top, this person does have this decreased ability to take that synthetic form and get it into the cell. They also have a combined MTHFR. So we're looking at two different variants here. And this really, this is the last gene in the chain that gives you about a a 50% decrease in your body's ability to do this final conversion. So we know that this person really is going to benefit from an already converted form. So methylfolate is that already converted form. They also have a homozygous. So homozygous means there's two variants. You get one gene from mom, one gene from dad. Both of those computer codes have been changed. This is the delivery system. So this is going to deliver the folate into the mitochondria. So not only do they have a hard time in this last step, but they have a hard time delivering it. So we know that we want to put in the right form and then we want to put in the right amount so that they have this constant cycle of usable folate for the body. Um, And so when we're just looking at a single, it's called uh, monogenic, monogenic, when we're looking at a single gene like MTHFR, we're missing so much. We're missing all of these other things that go along in the chain. So when we look at polygenic, we look at the whole chain, we can get a lot more valuable information that can really help direct us on what this individual needs. (coughs) Excuse me. And then 
we can look at B12 metabolism. How well do you metabolize and utilize B12? So transcobalamin one and transcobalamin two, you make transcobalamin one in the mouth. It protects the B12 in the stomach from acid degradation. And then TCN2, it delivers the B12 from the ileum, the small intestine to the liver. If you don't do that very well, we know that you may have considered routine plasma B12 levels. You may have lower B12 levels and it may be, you know, you could eat red meat all day long and you may just not be getting the B12 that you need because you're lacking the TCN1 and the TCN2. So we know at this point we can add in this converted form, a methylated uh, form of B12 to really help give you those nutrients that you need that are really important for pregnancy. And so we've talked a lot on the podcast before about the importance of not taking folic acid, taking a methylfolate, um, in case you do have that MTHFR gene mutation. And I think it's maybe what's I I'm seeing like 60% of the population has it, or what are you seeing as far as the percentage of people that have it? It is, it's about 60% of a population, but really about 80% of the Caucasian population does have some variant. Um, I see it fairly often. I look at hundreds and hundreds of these tests, but you know, I have seen people who have, do not have an MTHFR, their doctor tested the MTHFR. They're like, I don't have it. I'm like, mm, so something else is going on. And when we look at it, you know, they've got a homozygous FOLR2 and an FOLR1. And so we've, when you're just looking at the one gene, you're completely skipping these other important factors. And this is important to look at if you've experienced miscarriage, obviously if you're dealing with um, infertility, anything else for, from a fertility standpoint? From a fertility standpoint, you know, no, not really. Um, definitely from a mood and anxiety standpoint, this can make a big difference. If that's some of the things that you're experiencing, it may be really important to look at, at what are these, what these factors are. And then with the B12 interesting, that's interesting too, because if you're doing more of a plant-based vegan diet, perhaps you're low on B12, um, but maybe, maybe you're, you're not, you're eating the, you know, the grass fed meat and, but it's, you, you might just have a gene mutation and is it a gene mutation I call, or just a, a gene variant or it's a variant. So mutations happen in more than 1% of the population SNPs or variants happen in, in less than 1% of the population. People call them mutations. That's a little bit interchangeable, but, um, I think the move now is towards calling them variants. Variant. Okay. Yeah. And so then you would know for sure that, wait a minute. And especially if you're, if you're seeing it's low and then typically you're giving, um, yeah, injections, are you taking the right kind yet? Yeah, so there's some things that we can help to personalize in there. Any, any further comments on that one for you? No, nope, I don't think so. I think we covered okay. it. Okay, great. Clot risk is important. You, you go yeah. into labor, you, you want to know, or you, you're taking certain medications to help you you know, support that baby, you want to know what is your clot risk. So factor five is probably the highest clot risk. Factor X is only significant if you have, um, or factor 10 is only significant if it's homozygous. So this is a hetero, not super significant, but you know, if you had this combination or if you had, you know, this one was homozygous, you would have this increased risk of thrombosis. And it's really something that is important to know, to tell your doctor, if you're going to have surgery, you're going to have a C-section, you know, what is your clot risk? And also if there's miscarriage issues too, being yeah. like that is one of the, the things to look at. And, and we'll talk about, or we can maybe talk about that now, um, some things to help, or do you want to talk about that after about things that we can help to, um, if you have that? Yeah, no, you know, on here, really what's recommended if this pops up is, you know, letting your doctor know and just being cautious of any medications that are going to increase clot risk. Mm -hmm. um, but really looking at, you know, our whole, our whole point with all of this testing too, is really to reduce inflammation and get you the nutrients that you need. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as clot risk goes, it's really like just being aware and being able to tell your doctor, Hey, I'm, I'm at a higher risk. For example, we have a, a provider who her patient has breast cancer. She has to take a certain medication that can increase clotting. And we know that she already has this high clot risk. So at that point they can consider a different medication. Mm -hmm. Okay. More of a customized yeah. protocol for that. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. As we scroll down. So here again, we looked at men. Now we're looking at women. We're looking at that estrogen metabolism, metabolism and clearance. What happens, and I'm going to scroll down in a second and show you the chart, but you have this pathway 
um, that includes these genes. And it really has to do with your ability to break down pro-carcinogenic estrogen. So let's see if I can get it to scroll and behave. This is, we often see this in the, in the Dutch test too, where you can see which, which pathways the estrogen is going down. If it's going to down more of a DNA damaging pathway exactly. and making sure that you're going down the right pathway. So this is another kind of confirmation of that then too. It is. And of course my pathway chart is not on this example report, but we'll talk about it anyway. So we know that, you know, in the process of breaking down estrogen, you're going to make a four hydroxy estrogen, estrogen, which is pro carcinogenic. And we know that you have to have this ability to break it down. You do have an increased risk of things like breast cancer if you have an abundance of this pro-carcinogenic estrogen. But what we are looking at is for you as a woman, are you predisposed to this estrogen dominance? Do you have a problem breaking down that, that carcinogenic estrogen? We can really look at this here as far as do you, should you be using um, hormone replacement therapies? um, based on that. And, and I will tell you that I've worked with several women who are postmenopausal, and they are taking all of these estrogens and testosterones and all of these things. And then we look at their genes and we can say, Hey, this really isn't a good idea for you. You don't really break down these carcinogenic estrogens very well. It can really increase your risk of, of breast cancer. Um, and then when we're looking at that for that pregnancy risk, you know, if you have this woman, woman, you're having a harder time getting pregnant, you have that spare tire, that weight around the middle, you're running a Dutch test, you're looking at the genes. And so you can see genetically, hey, you're predisposed to this estrogen dominance, but then you can run that Dutch test and really get that confirmation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, being able to customize this, right? Because bioidenticals can, can be part of the solution even because a lot of the times you, you could have, not a lot of the times, but you could still have low estrogen, but it could be going down the wrong pathway. Not, not to scare anyone here, I guess, I guess more of a DNA damage. Cause it's sort of, is there anything you want to say around that? If someone's feeling a little bit worried? Yeah. I mean, for me, this isn't something to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to end up with whatever. W what we're looking at again is genes load the gun environment pulls the trigger. So we know at this point we can make these changes to our body. We can use things like calcium to glucurate. Um, we can make sure that we're not microwaving plastic. We're not drinking out of plastic, that we're avoiding high estrogenic foods, that we can really do these things to get us on the right path. And that's really how we're using that, this testing. It's not things like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get breast cancer. Oh my gosh, I'm going to die. These are things like here is your genes and here's how we can customize it for you to do the right thing. Yeah. And sometimes using DIM too, to help with excess estrogen. Exactly. Great. What do you have next? Yeah. Follicular sensitivity. We know this is a huge part of, of pregnancy here. And if you have this variant, you know, even heterozygous, so just the one or homozygous, if it was in the red and you had the two, we have this decreased follicular sensitizing hormone. We have a higher risk of PCOS. We have dominance and premature ovarian failure. We know that we can use that d or vitamin B8 in here to help you know, with that, because we do know that so much of PCOS has to do with that insulin resistance. But what we're looking at is, you know, are you having a harder time getting pregnant? Do you have this decreased follicular sensitivity? Um, and we know at this point, we can consider that routine mid-cycle um, fractionated estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, things that may really help here. So we can really refine that to you based on the fact that we can look at these genes. So, yeah, so we're dealing more with the, with the premature ovarian insufficiency or diminished ovarian reserve. So can you just kind of dig into that, just dig into that part a little bit more for us rather than um, the, the PCOS side of things like for, so we see this it's, there's a predisposition to it and then there's things we can do. Right. So we don't, we're not really, you know, we can have this decreased hormone follicular sensitizing hormone sensitivity. It's just doesn't work as well. So our, our Follicles are not really doing their job. They're not really doing what they need to do. But when we look at that, we can say, you have this predisposition here. These are how we can apply that for you. You know, if you need to go to your OBGYN and work through some estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, things that are really going to support um, making this action work better for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, hormone metabolism. This one is in the green. So nothing to worry about on here, but really looking at, you know, do you have 
higher levels of testosterone? Do you have higher levels of DHT? Um, again, it, we have variants here. We may be at risk of endometriosis and estrogen dominance, but we can look at these genes and kind of decide what is this approach, this personalized approach. And we know that higher levels of DHT, you have someone that comes in, they're trying to get pregnant, but they're also experiencing a lot of hair loss. When we do this test, if this person has this SRD 5A1, we know that higher levels of DHT actually lead to hair loss, especially in women. So we can look at that and say, well, you know, you have these higher levels of DHT and you're having this harder time getting pregnant. We can look at those therapies um, to really improve that. I saw you actually also have a test, an alopecia test too, if someone's got that as a specific test for that. We do have an alopecia test, um, very specific as far as this really looks at diet lifestyle that looks at diet lifestyle and actual prescriptives that would be beneficial for, for hair loss. Yeah. Cause many people, you know, not necessarily with alopecia, but definitely with autoimmune disease and then a fertility diagnosis. We see that a lot, celiac or hashies or maybe IBD, like, sorry, um, yeah, irritable bowel disease. Um, we, yeah, we'll see that with, with fertility issues. Just like the men's panel on the women's panel, we're looking at that thyroid support. Yeah. We're looking at that cellular recycling. I mean, we talked about the PCOS a little bit earlier, but you know, these ATG genes here, again, we're looking at, you have that insulin resistance. You have that higher risk of PCOS. You also have that higher risk of gestational diabetes. So let's say that you get pregnant. You know, what do you need to support the body so that you can avoid the, the gestational diabetes? This really is going to give us those clues, how we can lay it out and how we can put it together for you. You have, you have an increased need for thyroid support. We know that we have to support your thyroid, not just with supplementation, but with diet and lifestyle. And then we also know that you, you are higher risk of, of insulin resistance. We need to get you on this kind of a lower carb diet. We need to make sure that you're getting the nutrients that you need. We need to really routinely check. And I really recommend to a lot of my clients, get a, a glucose, blood glucose ketone monitor and test every day, several times a day, really track that. Um, it makes a huge difference for them because they don't really realize what's going on in that department until they start testing test. Don't guess. And then it's, they really realize, okay, this is really important. I'm genetically predisposed, but I also need to track these things to keep myself in balance. Yeah, that's key. We see that a, a lot with people feeling hangry or mood swings, irritable. I had that for years where I'd be like to my husband, you've got to stop the car. Now I need to eat. I'm about to either punch you out or, or faint. And you know, now that I've started to regulate my blood sugar and even with like waking up in the middle, you know, in, in the middle of the night, that can be blood sugar issues too. So we see this all the time with the low AMH and high FSH. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely cool to see it in black and white on the paper. Wait a minute, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Again, we're looking at that hypertension risk with women. So these are all pretty much the same. We're looking at that hypertension risk. Um, of course, really important for preeclampsia. Uh, good to know, you know, I have these genes. This really puts me at a higher risk of preeclampsia. What do I need to be doing? How do I help, you know, have my doctor monitor that? How do I monitor that myself? How is that really important for, for the health of, you know, getting pregnant and staying pregnant? Mm -hmm. And then the last, the last thing on this panel is we look at women's vitamin D transport. Vitamin D plays so many roles in the body from inflammation, which is really going to be key. If you have a lot of inflammation, um, you have a lot of immune response, you're going to have a harder time getting pregnant. And, and we can look at this vitamin D and say, okay, we know vitamin D is such a huge modulator of the immune system. We know that you have this is vitamin D receptor and D binding protein. You have a harder time, um, binding that, that vitamin D you, you may go out in the sun and spend an hour in the sun, but your vitamin D levels still may be very low. And we can look at that and say, okay, you have this increased need of vitamin D. We know that you have an increased need of supplementation because this process in your body is not working really well. So, you know, balancing hormones, all of the things that we need vitamin D is so ultra important for. Absolutely. Yeah. We see this all the time with it being like in the teens or in the, in the single digits and the functional range is 60 to 80 and then testing. Sometimes people shoot over it and they forget to, you know, it's a hormone. You want to make sure that you're, you're monitoring it. And so this can really kind of give us a, a, a key that, as you say, you can, 
be in the sun because usually it's, you know, 20 minutes in the sun, but you're doing more than that. And then it's, and you're not even absorbing it properly. Exactly. And, you know, really when we're looking at, at levels, you go to the doctor and they test it and they're like, oh, 22 is normal. That's, that's not an optimal functional range. If no. you're really looking at functional ranges, 60 to 80, you know, I, I love to see a vitamin D and 80. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is key for ma- male and female fertility. And, if, you know, could there be an auto autoimmune disease? Could there be gut infections? You know, why, why is it low to begin with? So it's interesting to see that if you have a predisposition to not being able to absorb it. Yep. Absolutely. And that's it on the women's panel, as far as what we're looking at, you know, getting pregnant, staying pregnant, using hormones after menopause. It's really a great test to know your body and what you need to support it on that hormonal level. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, okay. So let's just, as far as, so we get the results from the female panel, for instance, and then with that personalized plan kind of, um, maybe if, can you just give us a few examples of kind of some of the things that you would kind of look at? Um, I know the report kind of gives us stuff, but, um, yeah, what are you looking at? I guess. Yeah. What's great about the report is for the provider and for the, for the patient or the client, we put a summary on here. So here's these things based on your genetics that are highly recommended. These are therapeutics that are going to be really beneficial for you. So we're going to look at the folate, the B12, the selenium using uh, DCI 500 or, or d chironositol NAS enhancer helps to clear out the waste from the cells. Does this individual have, you've tested it. Do they have a thyroid issue? You know, do because of that, based on their genes, they may need some iodine. Um, we know metformin really beneficial for insulin resistance. So this is where we're looking at provider discretion. This is where you mm-hmm. want to know your patient, your client, what are these things that they need? And this is also where we want to test. Don't guess. We want to run these extra laboratory recommendations based on genes to really get a good read on what's going on in the body. Do these laboratory recommendations match up with your genes and your highly recommended therapeutics. And then you can look at all of the lifestyle recommendations as well. All of these things are going to support the body. So for me as a provider, I use this to create a roadmap. Mm -hmm. You don't just get in your car and go on a road trip and drive somewhere and not have a final destination in mind and not have a map of how to get there. We're using Google maps Back in the day, we had Rand McNally, we had to use our maps to get where we wanted to go. And so for this, this is where we're building this roadmap. These are your genes. This is your predisposition. What do we need to, one, reinforce? And what do we need to remove in order to give you that, that optimal, you know, safe travels on your roadmap? This is going to be that building block And then we can apply those other things. We can do the Dutch testing. We can do the thyroid hormone testing. We can look at gut and stool and digestion, and we can look at all of these things together. And now you have a roadmap. Yeah, I love it. It really, again, it just like gives the plan. We typically are working with like a type A busy professional, someone who's like, give me the plan. And this is like a true personalized plan that that, as I say, does the, helps with the roadmap. So we know exactly where I, where to go. And then the, the adherence part of it, because sometimes, you know, in a coaching program, either it's like, before you start something self, self-sabotage can be like, oh my goodness, I can't do it. It's too hard. Whatever may excuses you, you know, can come up with never a good time to start anything. Um, and then maybe two weeks in when you're like, oh, this is easy. I got it. And then, oh, maybe not so easy. And then the middle of it where you're like, oh, I think I got this. I've made all the changes. Um, and then kind of referring back to this is for, for adherence to be like, okay, wait, I know I've got an issue with insulin. I know vitamin, whatever it may be can help to then keep you on track. Can you kind of help? Can you talk, talk about that a little bit? It is the ultimate inpatient client compliance. Yeah, it really is. I find that I, I do nutrigenomic testing with every single client that I work with. I think it is essential to have the roadmap. But when we start looking at it, what's really mind blowing to them is we start to look at it and they go, oh my gosh, that's me. That I have those mood swings and I have that anxiety. And oh my gosh, all of these things. Oh my gosh, this answers so many questions. It's very mind blowing for them. And when they see that, they are so much more compliant because it answers 
all of these questions that they've had for so long. And when they can have this roadmap and really see like, there is this genetic component, they really toe the line, they are ready to go, they can really start to apply it because they know it's for them, it's based on their genes. And this is what they need to do really is amazing for helping people to get on board and stay on board. Yeah, it's a very empowering approach. You know, typically when you get these diagnoses like the low AMH and the high FSH and premature ovarian insufficiency or diminished ovarian reserve, and then you've been told donor eggs are your only option, or you had better rush to the fertility clinic right now because your time is running out and your eggs are too old. We got to go. And that is disempowering because you're waiting for someone else to then, you know, you got to pump your body full of medication and you may need to go to the fertility clinic at some point you may need to go, but either like, let's look at this side of things, get the roadmap, see exactly what's going on with your genes, personalized diet and lifestyle, and you'll either get pregnant naturally Or if you do go to the clinic and we're seeing where people are going to the clinic and after failed cycles, it works and they don't need to spend because it takes an average of three cycles and it costs us $60,000. They can avoid that financial and emotional heartache by building that strong, that strong foundation. And it's, I think it's very empowering. It, It really is. You know, I have nine times out of 10, I have my, my kids genetic testing sitting on my desk and I, even now, you know, years later, four years later, I will still open it up and refer to it and be like, okay, this is going on. Let me look at your genes and we can do this, that, or the other thing. And I continually use it as a roadmap. I reference mine all the time and okay, this is what I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I love it. Yeah. Tweaking, tweaking. And, um, do you have anything that you're obsessed with personally about right right now, either a book, a website, an app, a documentary, anything you are personally obsessed with? Ooh, anything that I'm personally obsessed with. Um, I am personally obsessed with creating an online course, a, a digital course for, it's actually going to be for parents, but for a genetic roadmap to better behavior. Mm. Um, And so I'm obsessed with putting that all together because I see all of my clients, you know, some of the first thing they'll tell me we'll work on this. And yes, I do work specifically with kids, but we start to work through these genetic protocols and they'll message me. I got a message yesterday. Oh my gosh, he's sleeping better. He's, his mood is better. His, he's so much more kind. They're very surprised that when we start to apply these things, how it changes their life really the same thing for, for women's health, for men's health. They're very surprised at how these changes start to happen because once you start to get in line, it starts to, to really get better pretty quickly. Yeah. Like for me, I used to think I was just a cranky person. Turns out my blood sugar was off and whole, all sorts of other gut infections and food sensitivities. And no, it wasn't, you know, I could still be prone potentially to irritability, but like, I just thought I was cranky all the time. And so we start to think that we're an anxious person, we're a depressed person, we're like this label that, you know, may have been put on us. And when we start to address the underlying cause of this, and if you're dealing with a fertility diagnosis, you know, there's, there's usually, you know, other health issues for us to look at. And then you can really start to identify these things in yourself and go, wait a minute, what's out of alignment and being able to look at it, this with the, with the genetic pieces is is key for sure. Um, Is there a success story, anything you want to share with us? I mean, I have success stories from all over the spectrum. Um, I don't often work with, with fertility clients, but I did have someone come to me. She was a referral and she was actually trying to get pregnant. And I said, you know, let's do this women's panel. We ran it in the process of the three week span of time of her getting the test, doing the test, us getting the results. She actually was pregnant. She was like, well, I just found out I'm pregnant, but she had had several miscarriages previously. What we did was really take this and apply it to her. What nutrients did she really need to support a healthy pregnancy? And she took it to her, her OBGYN. They looked at it. They really talked about what she needed to do to support that pregnancy. Um, she's almost nine months at this point, she's due pretty soon. And so she's really able to have this successful pregnancy, um, you know, we've applied all of these things, lots of previous miscarriages, but we wanted to give her that perfect fertile soil, what she needed to really, you know, keep a healthy, happy pregnancy. Nice. Any final thoughts on our subject here today, Dr. Pepper? Yeah, I, although, you know, nutrigenomics is my passion is my specialty. So I can 
read it off. I can help you create your roadmap. We can put it together. As far as the fertility, I definitely think, you know, people need to come to somebody who specializes in really looking at everything in the broader picture, using the nutrigenomics, using the Dutch testing, the hormone testing, all of these things. So definitely I think people should really come to you or, you know, provider like you to really figure out how they can get back on that path to having that healthy fertility. Um, I am the corporate clinical educator for GX Sciences. So for any providers that are listening who are really interested in utilizing this testing in their practices, head over to gxsciences.com. You can apply for an account. You can book a call with me. But um, I'm really passionate about everybody being able to use this in their practice because I think it's such a game changer. It was for us. It was for my family. It is for my clients. And I want everybody to be able to have access to it. It's really a, an affordable, amazing option to be able to give you your personalized roadmap. I agree. And then just sort of a simple thing. I actually have a kit here. So it's like, yeah. um, it's literally, you just kind of run through the kit like quick, quickly. It's like super easy. Just like yeah. a little swab and here we go. In the kit. And I should have had a kit on my desk. It's behind me, but yeah. um. I can go grab it, but like, in the kit, in the kit, yes, there you go. You get a swab. It's like a giant Q-tip. Mm-hmm. You're going to swab the insides of your cheeks about two minutes total. You want to get lots of cells applying enough pressure that you're getting some cells, but it doesn't have to hurt. Great testing to use on kids. I love it. Um, get your cells. You like put the little label, you seal it up, you drop it into a, you know, post office mail it to the lab. The lab is in Austin. Once we get it at the lab, it takes five to seven days for results. You get a little email that says your results are ready. Your practitioner provider can get on there, check the results, you know, get on a zoom call with you and go over these results and really refine what you're doing and how to improve your health. Love it. I actually got one more question here for you. The difference with, you know, 23 and me ancestry and this tell, okay. tell me that let's get into that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 23 and me is not my favorite. It's very, very overwhelming when you get a 23 and me report, they give you a few recommendations, but they do not know you on a personal level. They do not know your body. They have never looked at your health history. They do not really know what's going on. So they make really generalized recommendations on their summary page. And they may say, Oh, you have MTHFR. As we've discussed previously, we want to know what's going on in that whole chain. Um, It gives you that summary, but then they give you, I'm not kidding, 12,000 pages of raw data. And (laughs) if you want to look beyond the summary page, you have to know how to analyze that raw data. You have to know, it's called a reference SNP ID. You have to know the reference SNP ID. You have to know what the name of the gene is. You have to be able to search it. And then really figure out, well, how does this apply to me? Very overwhelming, very, very time consuming. And it's not personalized. You do not have your, you know, provider, practitioner, doctor, nutritionist, health coach going over this test result with you. You're just getting the summary. When you do a test like this, we have actually refined the genes that we're using to be the most effective and impactful for our health. We have right now, we have 121 genes that we look at, but we've looked at the scientific studies and data behind it and really backed it up. 23andMe, a lot of those genes that are listed are experimental or we don't know anything about them. These are scientifically backed uh, genes that we're looking at for your health. And then your provider, your practitioner is refining that and making it work for you. I mean, on every single test, there is a list of all of the studies that go coincide with all of these genes. And it's more than one study. We've really looked at the details and laid it out and said, these for us at GX Sciences are the most important uh, genes to be looking at as they apply to your health. So 23 Me again, looking more at that monogenic one, you know, one gene where we're looking at polygenic, we're looking at that whole chain reaction. 
Yeah, I've done the 23andMe and uploaded all that raw data into another system, came up with some overwhelming report, which which yeah. I did nothing with. So yeah, this kind of condenses it and really makes actionable steps so we can help you know move the needle and help people get pregnant. Um, and Ancestry, anything you want to say about them? A lot of people come to me and ask about privacy because yeah, those, sure. those other yeah. companies will share and sell your information. We never do that. That's, you know, your information is your information and that is private information. We're not selling it. We're not using it. We're not doing anything with it except putting this data together for you. Um, so yes, there are, I will tell you, you know, go, go down to Target. You can get a 23andMe test for like a hundred bucks, but is it worth your trouble? Because I will tell you, if you start to look for somebody to go through your 23andMe report, they are going to charge you a small fortune because I would rather somebody start off right, do a GX sciences panel, get the right answers. I most times will refuse to go through 23andMe reports. It's just too much. You might as well just do it right the first time. So mm -hmm. that's really, yeah. I love it. Awesome. Great. So um, definitely, and this is part of our fab fertile method. This, we, 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 we use the GX science test um, kit. So um, excited to, if you wanted to learn more about that, you can uh, book a call with me. So thanks again, Dr. Piper, for coming on, sharing your words of wisdom. It was really, um, really super interesting and impactful to know that there's things we can do. We don't just need to wait. Like it's not our, our genes are not our destiny. We can, you know, take, uh, take charge. So thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. It was great to connect.